I'm Lynn Belial. This is Max, and I wanted to show you how the sculptures that I call scent shards are made. First, uh, we start with a clay body for the mold because we have to have something to do the press mold on. And uh, this is a Longhorn white clay, and this is a 25 pound bag. It fires to cone 05, which is an earthenware fire. And this is only going to be the mold part. This is when we are doing a new face from a sculpture garden or an old cemetery. And we always use white clay because it doesn't leave a red residue on the stone that we're making the impression from. So I'm going to cut a slab about half an inch deep by the uh, width and the, the depth of the, the clay. And now we'll go outside and find a, an object to make our mold from. Normally, I'd probably be in an old graveyard or in a sculpture garden taking these, but for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm using the statue of the Lady of Guadalupe that I have in a fountain here. And what I'm going to do is take the clay that we've cut and press it onto the face or whatever portion of the sculpture that I want to mold. So I'm going to kind of wrap it around here and then hold it and press it. It's really important if you want to get the details to be careful and slow with this part. If you have an object that is deeply undercut, for example, if the chin goes way under and is not terribly flat, you're going to have a problem getting the mold off. So it's just a trial and error situation. We're going to press until we feel that we've gotten the whole face including the details molded. And now we'll come back to this in about three minutes when it's had a chance to set up a little bit. Okay, it's been not quite three minutes, but I think you can see how the impression has taken in here. I'm going to check it for details and it looks like it is, is fairly smooth and the only thing you need to be careful of is when the mold is this wet you need to put it in a place where it will get some support. I usually just put crumpled newspaper or uh, something else. Normally I'm in a travel situation when I do this. So I take a clay box with crumpled newspaper and just lay it in. And this will need to dry for about probably two days before it's ready to fire. Now we're back in the studio. This is not the same mold that I just took, but I wanted to show you the process with a mold that I would made previously. This one did come from a gravestone in Castroville, Texas. And you can see that it's been fired. It's very hard. Hard as a flower pot. It's been, uh, it's been earthenware fired. And it's difficult to tell what it is just yet. But when I take a slab of clay, and generally you take the slab and make it about the same size as the mold itself was. Um, you need to flatten it out and stretch it a bit, and you do that just by throwing it against your clay board, like this. And it is dusty. And this stretches it and also gets the air out. Watch out for your clay cutter. Then you just take the slab and look at the mold and decide which part you want. Um, Sometimes I take the whole face, sometimes I take half the face. I think for this particular demonstration I'm going to take half the face, or perhaps about two-thirds. So I'm going to lay it into the mold and press it in, not trying to be perfect, but trying to get the features as smooth as possible. Now you'll notice I'm not worrying about the edges because they will become part of the design when I start to add the embellishments. So I'm pressing in. Because the mold has been fired, it is um, very dry, and the moisture in the clay absorbs into the sides of the mold, which makes it fairly easy to remove almost as soon as, you, as you've pressed it. So that looks pretty good. And now when you take it out, the trick is sort of to fold it in half a little bit so that the sides come out evenly. It's not going to be perfect, but you don't want it to be perfect really. This is an impression and not a perfect replica. So when it comes out, you can see that you have the features well defined. You have some texture there of the clay itself. And now it's time to start doing the fun part, which is the embellishment. Okay, now that I've got the mold molded face on my clay board, I'm going to look at it and kind of decide what I want to do with it. 
And I think this part down here I'll use a stamp on. That will come last. This part up here is a little heavy, so I'm going to cut it off with my clay needle. I don't use many tools at all when I do this. And this is going to turn into a coil. Rolling coils is fun. You probably did this when you were in school and making clay snakes. Notice that you roll from the inside out. And try to keep it as even as possible. The mesh right here is for texture later on. I'm not using it right now. And then a good thing to do once you get a coil about the length that you want, of course, is to wet it so it'll stick better. A piece this size you don't really need to slip and score, and then you can just apply it kind of in a freehand manner, following the lines, or not following the lines, of your face. And sometimes you can put little curls and things on. I kind of like an Art Nouveau look when I do this. And then I'll probably take another look at that. Um, I may finish it off with, obviously I'm going to do some more work to it, and you will get a chance to see the finished mold. Uh, molded face, but um, I'll put a few more embellishments on to show you how I work. This is a little series of clay balls pressed in here. And if you've done any hand building, you know there are a lot of a lot of little tricks that you can use to to make embellishments on your work. And here where these meet, I might want to smooth them out. One thing you don't want to do is to make it slimy with water. That is never attractive. Uh, I might use my clay needle to add a few little indentations or even some little score marks here. And I have some stamps that are carved and I might even want to put a stamp on the face. Make sure you've thought this out because if you don't like it, there's no way to really undo it. So that's the process of getting started on it, and um, I would probably continue working on this for the next 20 or 30 minutes, getting it just right, and then as it sets up to be leather hard, I turn it over and sign it, and then put it aside to be fired. And that, again, would take about two days for it to, um, to be dry enough to be fired. And this also is fired to a Kono 5. This particular clay body is Longhorn Red. And um, I'll show you the firing process. Hi. Yesterday was a studio day, and I finished about 10 pieces that are going to be put in the kiln tomorrow. Today is the day where things dry. They have to be completely dry before they go in the kiln. They're fired in a little kiln like this. This is an electric step kiln, step kiln and it um, will fire at a low fire temperature, which is still about 1,900 degrees. And I will show you some finished finish pieces here. These are dry enough to fire. You can see that the color has changed from the clay that you saw yesterday. It's really important not to make any changes once they get to this stage. This is called bone dry. This piece right here is not a scent shard. This is a custom piece with letters stamped in it of a, pe a person's name that they'll use for their new house when they go. It'll be on their door. So if you're thinking of doing something like this, this technique really adapts to all kinds of different uses. This piece is what the clay looks like when it comes out of the fire, out of the kiln. This has been fired to cone 05. Again, it's 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And you attempt to fire as close to that as you can. What helps you do that are these little pyrometric cones which are made of the kind of clay that will melt exactly at 800 or a little more degrees, and that automatically turns your kill off. Those of you who have used ceramic kills before know all this. But it's not a difficult process. Before we go back into the studio to do a little bit of embellishment, I wanted to show you this piece to see if you can tell that this one is not quite dry yet. The thicker parts of it are a little darker in color. It's hard enough to be fragile, and it's certainly hard enough to break but um, it's not dry enough to be fired yet, so it's not bone dry. This one will wait till another firing. We're back in the studio now. This is my all-purpose studio. Um, I use it for painting. I use it for collage. Some of you who have seen my work on Etsy know that I make a lot of covers for um, iPads and Kindles, e-readers. But today, it's a clay studio. So I'm taking these pieces of fired but unglazed clay, and I want to put a patina on them that makes them look aged. 
like this piece and also brings out the texture of the stamps and what other embellishments I've added to the faces. So after a lot of experimentation, I figured out that, well, first of all, we don't want to glaze it because glazing will seal the porosity and we want the clay to breathe. And while it's still fired and hard, we also want it to be able to disperse the essential oils because that's an integral part of the whole scent shard idea. Um, so first of all, I worked with acrylic paint, which did not which wasn't bad, but it still, because of the plastic nature of it, didn't seem to go with the clay quite as well as I wanted to. So I found some walnut crystals. This is walnut ink, and it's made from the shells of, of walnuts. And um, if you've pe peeled a lot or cracked a lot of walnuts, you know that it can turn your hands black. And I use that to kind of keep the porosity, but add a little bit of depth. And you can also get it commercially made like this. Um, this is a terracotta cover, color. It may not be dark enough, but we'll try it. But in order to prevent getting too much on, I'm going to spray this with water first. And notice when I spray it with water, it dampens it, but because the clay is porous, it doesn't melt it, and yet it absorbs the water. And now I'm going to spray on some of this terracotta ink. And you can see it's darkening it. We don't want it darkened all over. What we want to do is put on a patina, so almost immediately... I take a rag and wipe the upper surfaces so that the walnut ink gets into the cracks. And it adds a nice natural finish. Walnut ink is totally organic. Probably I'd add a bit more patina, adding a few more coats of this. Um, I may add a few other things, substances, perhaps rub some moss into it, do some... Um, some specific rubbing with places that are that need to be darker, like right up here I can see this little stamp might need to be darker, so I'll go back and work with that. But basically it becomes part of the clay at this point, it won't wash out, and uh, it gives a nice finish to the, to the scent shard. You'll see um, at the end of this little video some ways to use these scent shards. One of the really important parts of the concept is the essential oil. And if you're interested in essential oils, I've been a certified aromatherapist since 1989, and I maintain a research site with a, a partner who is a biochemist at chemaroma.com, and it's a nonprofit educational site, so lots of good things there about essential oils. But the essential oils that come with these little shards are 100% pure, and they're lavender-based, which is a very nice oil. So that's the process, and now I'll show you a couple of ways that you can use these little sculptures to bring a touch of art and serenity to your surroundings. Thanks. I like the smaller ones. I like the texture, and I like two of them together, actually. Um, these two are from different cemeteries, but they're both pretty in their own way, both interesting, and um, I have them here in a bowl of clementines with their essential oil with some sage and some basil, and they look really pretty, I think. This is Pharaoh. He's sitting on the Sunday paper, but he wants to tell you that he likes scent shards, too. Well, that's the process. I hope you found it interesting. When I'm finished with the shard, it looks like this, and I sign it and number it on the back. I sign it with the name of the firing, the particular firing I'm doing now. It's called, I'll call Terra. So this is the Terra fire, T-E-R-R-A, not T-E-R-R-O-R. -R -R. And um, they're numbered, usually there are 18 to 20 in each firing. So this one I think is Terra 16. Um, each one comes with a 15 milliliter vial of oil, and this is lavender and citrus and they're 100% pure and organic, and they're packed in their own little rustic pouch with a scent shard label. And um, you can use them for all different things, and I think that you'll enjoy them. The way to get in touch with me and the way to see more of these is on my Etsy website, and the last frame of this video will have that address on it. Also check out Kim Aroma because the study of essential oils is absolutely fascinating. It really can make a difference in your outlook on life. So thank you very much for watching the process, and um, I hope you enjoy your scent charts.